All right. It's Thursday in New York City. It's PRN.FM. My name's Mark Farrell. How are you doing today? My Thursday's great. I love Thursdays. The weekend's on tap. And around these parts in the tri-state area, the weather's going to be stellar. Yes! No more humidity. No more rain. No more hail the size of golf balls. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? When you're in the midst of summer and there's hail falling. Makes you think, man, there's something really wrong with this planet. Maybe there's something to this global warming thing. Well, you know, it's really hot in Brazil. Yesterday, did you see the game? Argentina in the Netherlands. What a nail biter. Oh, my God. This World Cup is, I don't know whether it's just the increased fever of World Cup this year, but it's got me on the edge of my seat. I did not see the game. I saw the highlights. But it ended with a shootout. And guess who advances on Sunday to confront Germany? Argentina. Very, very cool. Will be a great game. I tell you, I'm going to miss the games. World Cup is pretty cool. You know, it's great that it's maybe every four years. Sometimes I was thinking it should be like the Olympics, you know. Every two years, maybe the game should come around. But I think it really kind of increases the enthusiasm, the zeal. And this particular time around, I don't know, it just feels like more people got on the bandwagon. And some people, they kind of piss me off about this because they're like, well, are you in it because everyone else is in it? I'm like, well, yes, because it's only four years, so how could you be in it, you know, in the midst of those four years? Do I watch European soccer in between the World Cup? Every now and then. It's very different, of course, than American soccer. Uh, a lot of psychology, a lot of history involved, which I never knew. How teams tactically take on the ball, pass, score, shoot, defense, offense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I am one of those people who totally, totally get into it. I stopped actually physically watching the games after America lost, but was reading about them. I just don't have time to watch, you know, 90 minutes plus of soccer. But the highlights are always good. Uh, thank God for ESPN. I thank them every night along with my good fortune and wealth and everything else in life. <laughs> Not that I'm one who says prayers, but if I was, I would be thanking ESPN, that's for sure. But I'm really going to miss the commercials. The commercials are really outstanding. There's one that really stands out in my mind where they show a hospital in the uh, infirmary, I guess, where the babies, all the newborns are, and you can tell the babies are wall-to-wall. They are maxed out. And the nurses are speaking in uh, Spanish. And they're saying to each other, and the caption says, one nurse to the other, what happened nine months ago? (laughs) I love it. It's actually for a car commercial, but I didn't get how that kind of equated to a car commercial. Maybe everyone was conceived in the back of a Hyundai or Honda. I'm not sure. Anyway, it was very, very clever. So uh, actually reminds me of another commercial unrelated to the World Cup. Uh, The Swiffer commercial, have you seen it? It's been running probably for, hmm... I'd say three to four, five, six months. It's really cool because you know I'm a proponent, major advocate for people with disabilities, being visually impaired, born with a congenital retinal defect in both eyes. I am one who's always been active in getting people in the mainstream, persons with disabilities. Why not? They deserve a chance. So actors... We've heard about this, and I've actually done a show about this, a segment, how many actors that are hired to play a person or persons with disabilities in uh, TV shows, sitcoms, dramas, and movies are not disabled. So they hired somebody, they hire people who are able-bodied to play a disabled role, which I think is kind of lame. Anyway, so there's a Swiffer commercial out that you probably have seen. Uh, that is about uh, a male, which is I'm, I'm really kind of psyched because on two levels, because I'm kind of a neat germaphobe. I wouldn't say germaphobe, but I'm a neat freak. And uh, my, my my wife would attest, testify to that. I like things very orderly. And so apparently this husband in the um, show, the Swiffer commercial, loves things very neat and tidy as well. And he takes it a step further than I do because I don't even think I have a Swiffer. I don't even know if I can spell Swiffer. <laughs> Because you know it's probably spelled very cool. And um, so he's going around his house, Swiffering, if that's such a word. Yeah. And he's got one arm. Very cool. And he's a father. I think there are two or three kids running amok. And it's a very kind of modern reflection of what today's family can look like. Whether it's with uh, possibly him being a stay-at-home father. Um, I don't know if I actually got that message. But the fact is that, you know, Swiffer is easy to use. And more importantly for me, and for hopefully subliminally, the message is that 
people with disabilities are being cast in commercials nowadays, which is very, very cool. There's another commercial that escapes my mind right now. Maybe my son Luke can remember. Luke is in the studio today. Luke is five years old. Luke, you want to come over here and say hello real quick? No? You've been practicing your voiceover to say prn.fm. <laughs> he's shaking his head no, but he's got everything to keep him quiet for the next hour or so. Leapfrog, Mott's snacks, applesauce, cars, all the good things that you uh, hold near and dear to your heart when you're five years of age. So on the way over here to the studio this morning, the lavish PRN studios on the Upper West Side, I was uh, purchasing a few things. First was a pack of gum. I only chew gums when I'm gum um, when I'm on the air. I don't know what it is. I, I like the natural sugar rush. Natural? Did I say natural sugar rush? I like the sugar rush. It also kind of warms up the uh, jaw a little bit. And I paid over, geez, I think two forty something for a pack of gum. Well, that's my fault. I'm a jerk for buying gum at Port Authority because obviously you can buy much cheaper in different stores and in New Jersey and surrounding states and maybe wherever you are, you can buy it much cheaper because uh, in airports, etc. So then I was thinking about my uh, the next interview we're going to hear. And with that notion, with the expensive pack of gum, I was thinking about you can't even buy the Daily News for a dollar. You can't buy the New York Times for a dollar. You can't buy the Post. You can't buy any New Jersey paper. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe you can buy the Asbury Park Press. Is there a newspaper by you that costs less than a dollar? A daily paper. So my point is there's not much in life that you can buy for a dollar. And can you imagine surviving on a dollar a day? Surviving, that's food, if you want to call it rent, living expenses, clothing. Hard to fathom, right? A dollar. Go to Starbucks right below us here. A cup of coffee. Not that I drink coffee. I love the smell. Can't drink it. <laughs> probably can't afford it either. But I think a cup of coffee is probably, you know, three, four dollars. Once in a while, I'll splurge and have a chai latte. And that's a medium or a small, like a sub five dollars maybe. So it's really expensive. So what, certainly in this area, New Yorkers and anyone in a metropolitan city, no matter where you are in the world, can't fathom, you know, living on a dollar a day. Well, there's a new book, Living on a Dollar a Day, The Lives Behind the Faces of the World's Poor. really caught my attention for many levels, on many levels, because obviously it really puts what we know exists. But it's like one of these things that we just, that kind of ebbs and flows. We hear about it, then we put it out of our minds, or you're up late and you see one of those commercials, and or we see something in the mail, solicitation to sponsor a child. But the reality is it's not getting any better. But thankfully, an author, spokesperson, lawyer, professor, Thomas Nazario uh, from San Francisco, actually originally from New York City, is joining us today. He authored the uh, really new, brilliant book with great pictures, Living on a Dollar a Day. Welcome, Thomas. Hi, good morning. How are you, my friend? I'm pretty good, pretty good. So are you glad you made the move west? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I made the move west uh, quite some time ago. It's It's been pretty nice out here, though I do miss New York uh, an awful lot from time to time. You know, one of the first things I think about, certainly besides the fact that you couldn't even possibly even fathom living on a dollar, even a half a day around here, is how the world is so connected, more and more connected, monthly, annually. But the parts of the world that we're talking about today, the um, did you go on four continents, I believe, to capture your book? That's right. Four continents, ten different countries. They are still at a standstill, or maybe even worse off. And we're progressing, you know, fivefold, tenfold. And we're not doing, seemingly, we're not doing anything about it. We're ignoring this. Well, there is a tendency, and it's a historic one, to ignore uh, people on the bottom, to kind of walk over them, to forget that they exist, and to go on with our lives, uh, particularly those who have lives that are relatively su successful. Have, have busy days, have families to take care of, and so on and so forth. So, uh, yeah, many of the world's people are forgotten and impoverished and have all sorts of difficulties in life, and uh, I, I guess we don't pay them enough attention, and that's one of the reasons why we wrote the book. When did you become a child advocate? 20, 30 years ago? Well, uh, yeah, I wrote a book, uh, oh, some time ago, probably about 25 years ago, called In Defense of Children. 
But I, I think I really became an advocate for kids when I was a teenager myself. I grew up in Spanish Harlem, and I realized that if you really wanted to make an impact on someone's life, you had to capture them relatively young and point them in the right direction or give them the assistance that they need uh, before it's too late, before they get on the wrong tracks, and, uh, and all of a sudden you can't pull them out. So uh, when I became a lawyer, that's the kind of work I did. I, I got somewhat of a reputation for caring about kids. Uh, I, I went to work for the United Nations and various other NGOs and eventually did a lot of work international and uh, eventually uh, decided to write a book about the poor of the world, who are, of course, mostly women children. Now, that was pretty astute for you as a teenager to realize the, um, obviously, the early, the impressionable years and how you have to stay on track. Was it your upbringing, your parents, who helped you uh, meld into that uh, mindset? Well, I think it was part of it, but, uh, you know, I saw a lot of my friends kind of making the wrong decisions uh, at the wrong times in their life, and all of a sudden uh, I lost them. You know, they just went off somewhere and went into a gang or decided to hold up a store or something, and they were gone. And uh, there just seemed to me to be so many important things to do in life that I didn't want to go down that path, and I began to talk to some of my friends, you know, uh, it's going to be more difficult for us. I'm, I'm Puerto Rican Cuban, but uh, as long as we stay on track and uh, do the right things, uh, we'll, we'll turn out okay. And luckily, uh, I've done relatively well for, for in my life, and uh, and I've been able to bring some friends along. Puerto Rican and Cuban, I'd love to be invited over your house for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring the wine. Yeah, I'm a pretty good cook these days, too. Wow, what a great combination. Now, why do you think, I mean, you've been traveling nations for years and years, and we're going to get to the organization you found and are president of currently, but why do you think we are, I mean, I have my interpretation and reason why, but why do you think nations, the big five, the big eight, aren't doing more? Uh, you know, I think it's uh, it's partly because of the same kinds of reasons why individuals don't do more. Uh, a lot of the big eight uh, countries, uh, a lot of the, the wealthiest countries in the world, in reality take more than they give to poor countries. Uh, and uh, And many of them feel, in some cases rightfully so, that the kind of investments that they make in in impoverished countries don't go to the to the right people. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of corruption, mm-hmm. and uh, and you know some may argue that not enough good is happening with regards to the the care that uh, and, and assistance we give, particularly in Africa. But the truth is that uh, even in Africa, life has gotten better, at least over the last 25 years. There are more children in schools in Africa. There are more kids getting uh, uh, health care. There are more immunizations being delivered. Uh, and there are more countries in Africa that at least are akin to a democratic uh, country, uh, though there's, of course, enormous problems not only in Africa but in the Middle East and elsewhere. You know, it makes me think that I guess more countries would be less pissed off at us. Sorry to be, um, to be less eloquent there, but if we went into countries rather than dethroning the leaders because we didn't like their political views or we wanted their oil, whatever your perspective is on Iraq and other countries of such, that if we did that because we want to um, put someone in power of the local government who would allow us to come in and give them running water, to give them food, to give them the ability, the education, the farm, etc. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the best way to encourage countries to be kind and and loving to other people is to model that conduct ourselves. How do, uh, this sounds like a very obvious question, but uh, Thomas Nazario, how does the poor become poor and remain poor? Obviously, I think the corruption aspect answers that. Well, yeah, that's part of it. There are a lot of obstacles to alleviating poverty, uh, certainly at least a dozen, if not more. But most of the poor of the world are born poor. Uh, and remain in a cycle of poverty for generations. Uh, just so you know, uh, if, if we look at the two and a half billion poorest people in the world, about 55% of them are subsistence farmers. And so wow. they live off the land. And if their crops don't come in, uh, if there's a drought, if there's poor soil, 
uh, they often are malnourished. Sixty percent of the children who live in families that do subsistence farming are malnourished. Uh, so they have a very, very difficult life. And uh, often they don't own the land they work. The land is essentially it's sharecropped. And, uh, uh, and, and another percentage of, of the world's poor also live off the sea, and they live on little boats. There are about 40 million of them. They produce enough fish to feed about uh, 200 million people. But that's how they live. They live on these tiny little boats. We capture some of their stories out of Cambodia. And, and that's all they have, their boat, their family, and whatever they catch. So the poorest of the world are born poor. They don't have an adequate education. In many cases, they're illiterate. In many cases, the only skills they learn are the skills that they gather from their parents. And they live, again, another life in poverty. And even those that go to school will probably only stay in school till about the fourth or fifth grade. And so it isn't like they have a lot of skills. And in your book, Living on a Dollar, you state that we need to start with women and children. Why so? Well, uh, there's a variety of reasons. One, of course, is that women and children and children are the poorest people in the world. And so and for, uh, for the purposes of satisfying morality, you probably go to the poorest first. The second reason is that the women of the world uh, nurture uh, all of the children. Uh, they have... Uh, an enormous responsibility with regards to rearing their children. Uh, and uh, in taking care of those children, we're looking after the future of the world. And, and another reason is that uh, once we give women um, health care, once we give them an education, once we uh, help them in a variety of ways, they're less likely to have more children, and they're less mm-hmm. likely to be economically dependent on men. True who uh, often abuse them throughout the world and leave them impoverished. So to build their economic abilities to stay afloat is a a great way of, of, of in fact, lifting women and children out of poverty. And Thomas, we cycle right back to political viewpoints. Yeah. yeah. And uh, religious viewpoints where, you know, obviously how many countries are the women are abused? if If they want to work, they can't work. If they want to be educated, they can't be educated. Um, and where they are allowed to be abused sexually. Very, very true. Yeah, it's, it's you know, domestic violence and a variety of other kinds of abuse keep uh, so, so many women in poverty and, in fact, uh, damages their hearts and minds in ways that uh, would be very, very difficult to repair. This is PRN.FM. My name is Mark Farrell. My guest is Thomas Nazario. He has written a new book, Living on a Dollar a Day, The Lives Behind the Faces of the World's Poor. Now, Thomas, I think you have a lot of clout. You've testified before Congress, and I call America's First Lady not Mrs. Obama, who I have a great deal of respect for, but Oprah. So you have (laughs) Oprah on your side. Now, you and Oprah should be able to cure everything underneath the sun, especially poverty. Well, you know, I was on an Oprah show uh, some years ago, in fact, a couple of them, but, uh, you know, she doesn't do her big show anymore, and I don't have her uh, home phone number, but if you have it, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think Oprah can probably conquer this, you know, on her own if she really is truly driven here. Um, now, what did you testify in front of Congress about? Well, back back in those days, I was uh, testifying about the condition of children in the United States, just how many are abused and neglected how many are impoverished, how many go to poor schools, uh, how many are what they used to call illegitimate, so on and so forth. So I was trying to give uh, individuals in Congress kind of an overview of the state of children in the United States. And uh, and in those days, that was my expertise. I've kind of... uh, uh, I still know a lot about kids in the United States, but nevertheless, now I'm focusing on women and children throughout the world. I'm not sure if you know this, Thomas, but uh, the main thing I do, in addition to a radio show, is I speak to kids nationally uh, about overcoming adversity, anti-bullying, drugs and alcohol, and mental health, and, and other critical issues. So I'm yeah. right there with you. And I mean, obviously, I don't address poverty because of where we are, not that we do not have poverty in the U.S., But, um, I mean, as I, uh, you mentioned, I concur a thousand percent. I mean, this is America's future here, and um, it behooves us on many levels, even just the fact, mere fact that they have an opportunity, should have an opportunity for a fair and healthy and happy life. Yeah. I I mean, again, I I couldn't agree more. Uh, And particularly, you know, one of the things that damages children in the United States so much is uh, is poverty. Uh, if, If you're in a family that, 
doesn't really have an awful lot of money or in a single uh, parent household or so on and so forth, and you end up going to schools that basically warehouse you and you don't get a decent education, you don't get an opportunity to go into college, you just don't, you don't get many opportunities in life, then, uh, then, if, then you have very little to lose if you decide to, to go wayward, to take the wayward path and, and, and do something else. So uh, even in the United States, one of the richest countries in the world, poverty inflicts so many kids. And more so telling than the great writing in your book, Living on a Dollar a Day, certainly are the pictures. And it's an oversized book. And obviously you realize this, you're a smart man, that <laughs> pictures are, are worth more than a thousand words, especially when you're trying to paint a picture of the critical crisis that so many of the nations are uh, with the poorest nations uh, pictured in this book yeah. are. So obviously that was a, a serious consideration in, in putting this and, and how to do this in the four continents that you shot. So I imagine that was an undertaking. Yeah, it took us about three and a half years to produce this book wow. uh, just because uh, we decided to go with uh, one of the best photographers in the country. Uh, and uh, Well, I heard you were cajoled in doing so. <laughs> <laughs> she... Uh, She's quite a photographer, and we well, originally we were going to go with about three or four different mm-hmm. photographers and shoot the countries uh, separately. But uh, yeah, we decided to go with her largely because if she took all the photographs, it would seem more seamless instead of running into different styles in the book. Well, I'm sure she understood your message, so that's why it would translate so. Yeah, yeah, the photographs are great, and of course, uh, y- you know, one of the things we like about the photographs it doesn't demean people. Uh, I think they're shot with dignity and uh, and shot with just this, the simple intent of, of giving individuals a sense of the lives they lead. Uh, so many of these people work so hard, uh, receive such little compensation, and barely survive. And uh, and the truth is that poverty kills. You know, if 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 you're poor around the world, you're likely to live about half as long as if you're relatively wealthy and live in a in a, in a developed country. So uh, we wanted to capture their lives. You mentioned the word dignity, Tom, and that really kind of resonates with me because you don't have to be rich or a middle class to have dignity. You can be poor and still have pride dignity, and a lot of great ethics in life. And I think that's a misnomer. Well, I mean, nobody wants to be poor. No, uh, nobody wants to be poor. Um, But nevertheless, a lot of the people we visited were very, very poor, but certainly had an awful lot in the way of dignity. Uh, They were proud of what they did, uh, in spite of the fact that much of what they did were jobs that no one else (laughs) around here might do. Uh, And uh, and, and many were actually relatively happy. Uh, uh, they had a lot of problems, but they took a lot of joy out of their children, uh, their work, and their possibly one meal a day that they might have, uh, and still smiled and still laughed, and, uh, and it wasn't as depressing as we thought it would be. Glad to hear. The Forgotten International is a organization, nonprofit organization you founded a few years ago uh, as a president as well. I mean, obviously, this is a um, hand-in-hand tandem uh, message that you're working on on a larger scale in addition to your book. Yeah, we uh, we fund organizations around the world, uh, very grassroots organizations in about seven different countries that work uh, to help alleviate poverty. Uh, particularly with regards to women and children. So another arm of what we do is uh, these mini-grants around the world. We also send people around the world to work with NGOs that help people. And we, on occasion, deliver goods to schools and medical clinics and things like that. Do you have a macro? And I'm putting you on a spot here, so forgive me for doing so. But I'm sure when you go to bed at night, there's a lot of bubbles over your head, a lot of great dreams. Some of them are pipe dreams. Some of them will become reality. But... If you could put the G8 leaders in one room and or have a conference, would that be something you'd like to do and, and talk about? Obviously, the agenda would be, uh, first and foremost, poverty. Yeah, yeah, I, I certainly would like to do that. In fact, uh, I, I wouldn't mind running a huge foundation someday and, and trying to do some innovative things to uh, uh, create some models that a lot of people could uh, replicate around the world. Uh, so, uh, yeah, these are things that uh, that I dream about. I'm still waiting for our a call from someone that's willing to give us $10 million to do this work. But uh, right now, uh, we're just doing the best we can. So maybe Oprah didn't lose your number. You just lost hers. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully she's listening. 
<laughs> that would be a good thing. Well, you know what? Uh, what was your operating budget a year for um, Forgotten International? Oh, it's about four hundred thousand a year. Okay, so, so not, yeah, well, you need some yeah. money. <laughs> you got the yeah. will. You got the drive. You have the initiative. I've spoken to one of your two of your um, colleagues, and they're just as passionate as you are. Um, yeah. And certainly, do the proceeds of the book go towards that? That's right, exactly. And yeah. where's the book available, Thomas? Well, of course, it's better. It's available at Barnes and Noble and better bookstores, uh, and of course, Amazon. And finally, I have to ask you because this just really kind of gets under my skin, especially here in New York City, and for you in San Francisco as well. Maybe there are organizations like Meals on Wheels out there, where the abundance of food on a daily basis gets wasted. Yeah. And as a per- person who is a um, trailblazer for people who are impoverished, that must uh, really get under your skin. It does. And, you know, not only does that get under my skin, but when I go to restaurants and see people leave food on their plates and it all gets tossed away or I, I watch people pick up tabs that are, you know, four or $500 for uh, three or four people uh, or expensive bottles of wine, I think about what, you know, what that could purchase in, in an impoverished country or village. Uh, how many people could it feed? Uh, it's just uh, deplorable. And the, the truth of the matter is that we all have the capacity to help the poor, uh, at least, you know, most of us, because it doesn't take an awful lot. Uh, we, uh, for example, we can build a, a classroom to a school in India and pay for a, a, a staff of teachers at that school for a year for probably about $1,200. Uh, so it's just amazing what you can do with a little bit of money in some of these countries to help some village or some school or some clinic and so on and so forth. And many of us just, uh, as you were saying earlier, will not think twice about, you know, buying a cup of coffee for four bucks. It's really unimaginable, especially when you throw out the number of $1,200. Yeah. And I had a similar thought uh, yesterday when I was driving. I don't know if they're out west. Probably not. They started probably in the Midwest. They are, I guess, what are they called? Food buffets? Or they're really becoming more popular, uh, maybe trending more on the coast now because I think it originated in the Midwest. But the um, it's called a golden corral. So you see these Americans. I'm sure they're not the most skinny Americans going to these places and just gorging themselves. Mm. You know, it's just enough to make you sick just thinking about it. Anyway, that's far getting off a little off point there. <laughs> uh, what's your website for um, living on a, pr- a dollar a day and also for Forgotten International? Yeah, you can probably just go to the Forgotten International uh, and all the links that you'll need are right there. But uh, it's That's forced- .org? Yeah, exactly. The Forgotten International. International is abbreviated I-N-T-L dot org. Tom Nazario, author, speaker, lawyer, do-gooder, advocate for children <laughs> worldwide. Real pleasure, and uh, I'm waiting for that invite. I'll bring I'll bring a bottle of wine out of compliment any dish that you make, my friend. All right. Well, I'll keep you on my invite list. All right. Keep up the great work, and if I bump into Oprah, we'll get her on board. Thank you. All the best to you. Thanks for your time. This is PRN.FM. On the flip side, we're going to be hearing the latest on the Oscar Pistorius trial. He was, um, the judge actually stopped the trial over 30 days ago for a psychiatric evaluation. How did that end up? And advocates for the deaf and blind are really pissed at Apple. They want them to do more. That's next on PRN.FM. Hey, it's Mark Farrell coming to you live from New York City, the Big Apple. PRN.FM, 888-874-4888 is our toll-free number. It's on Gary Null, your call, so do give us a call. 888-874-4888. Just had a conversation about the poverty in the world. Great conversation. Thanks to Thomas Nazario. And how many of you have pulled out your cell phone recently, no matter what the make is, and said, oh, man, I just cannot read this. Or this app is just too hard to navigate because of you couldn't hear it, you couldn't see it well enough. Well, a lot of advocates for the blind and disabled community are fighting back. <laughs> They're really kind of uh, pushing Apple back to the wall because this is pretty interesting. 11.1 billion market for uh, persons with disabilities worldwide. 
$1.1 billion. So that's a huge market. So you would think these manufacturers would really get on board and say, okay, we really need to develop some applications here for the deaf and blind community that make it much easier for them to navigate. And more importantly, think about this, or equally as important, the baby boomers. Do you think they're wearing um, glasses that are really aren't high-powered or contacts? So when you think about only or nearly 21 million adults in the U.S., their um, vision, they will experience a lot of vision loss in their lifetime. So that's a lot number right there, 21 million in the U.S. alone. So I think it would behoove these manufacturers. Now, Apple is saying that they are making their developers or they are highly suggesting to their developers that their apps include accessibility functions. Well, bravo to you, Apple. That's a no-brainer. I could have said that to you. Maybe I should be on the board of the Apple company. But it's true because there are so many different applications that I have that I use a magnifier for that um, really makes it easier for me to use. But then I may have to use dual magnification with my glasses that are magnifiers, thanks to Walgreen or CVS or Dwayne Reed. For $15, I have a nice, cool, trendy pair of magnifying glasses at the... What's the rate? 3.25 magnification? So it's pretty strong. That, coupled with my magnifier, I can pretty much see everything on my phone. So, but that's a struggle. And that's in optimal light. So I, I don't think it's a big stretch. And, and there was a lawsuit, a class action against Apple a few years ago. And I think they're, they're trying to go about this in a friendly, tactful, okay, Apple do the right thing method by approaching them and saying, listen, there are... A huge, there is a huge audience out there for you to tap into, right here and abroad, internationally, as those numbers of 11 point billion persons with disabilities reflects. So again, it would behoove them. They're asking apps to. Uh, well, one of the problems is actually with iPhones, as you realize, one of the attractive parts is that they're very smooth and sleek, glossy, depending on the color, and so therefore, people with vision loss or blind, or visually impaired, or disabled, like myself, there's nothing to touch. So everything is software-based. So perhaps they should make a shell that could fit over a portion of the screen. This is my idea right now. So I should copyright this. Okay. On the 10th day of July, 2014, <laughs> I came up with this great idea, copyright trademark, Mark Farrell, 2014. So maybe that would be a good idea, a sleeve that could fit on the actual phone. Uh, and this, we're talking about, you know, um, tablets, we're talking about iPads, we're talking everything. Because, you know, this article is very interesting. Reuters reported this yesterday, by the way, if you want to look up this article, called Advocates for the Deaf and Blind Want More from Apple, that are saying that with all this technology in existence, the deaf and blind community feel like they're standing still. Now, I can only speak for myself being visually impaired, but really, in the last five years, I think it's taken leaps and bounds my lifestyle has in terms of using iPad, my iPhone, uh, even my Mac to make things fonts larger, to make things more accessible. I use speech text once in a while, but actually in iPhone, the next version of the iPhone, they're going to have a speak screen. So they didn't go into great detail about this. I don't know if the screen is going to be something that runs across all the applications on the phone, or is it just one particular screen that's going to have maybe some basics on it. But again, I can understand how the problem would be the fact that the phone itself, physical phone itself, doesn't have any physical buttons. So if you're blind or visually impaired, that's a challenge. But again, possibly that screen idea that <clears throat> Mark Farrell came up with on the 10th day of July <laughs> could possibly remedy that. But people are up in arms about this. As a matter of fact, if anyone's listening, of course Steve Jobs is not listening. I get pissed off at him about maybe once a week when everything crashes. But um, it would be interesting to um, try. And I'm going to go with the Samsung next because I think I'm done with Apple. Because I think they were a pioneer. I think they were great for the marketplace as a leader. And I think a lot of the competitors have met their standards and surpassed what they are delivering to customers, especially in the technological aspect for accessibility. So I say it right here. I'm looking at my phone. Um, there's certain things I can make larger and certain things I just cannot. And I think that any screen that you have should be able to be modified, enlarged, 
uh, speech, text, audible text, whatever the disability or accessibility option could allow it to be. So they want to make this law, actually. And when I read this, I'm not really sure how I felt about this, making this law. How do you feel, Luke? (laughs) My five-year-old son just gave me both shoulders up in the air with both hands going like, I don't know, Dad, but when I figure it out, it's going to be really darn good. I'd love to hear your input. 888-874-4888. That's 888-874-4888. Do you think this should become law? I got to mull that over a little bit longer. I'm leaning towards yes, because I think the further we continue, we have accommodations laws, uh, laws. We have ADA laws, which is, are, of course, fall under the ADA. Accommodation laws fall under the ADA. So when you're dealing with consumers, why wouldn't this be law? I guess it makes sense. So what kind of phone do you have? Do you find it easy to navigate? I'm not talking about when you're driving and you're using your knees to drive and you're texting with your hands. And uh, No, no, that's not cool. And we don't want to make technology so easy that people without disabilities are using it to make their life easier, like in a dangerous aspect, like driving behind the wheel. That wouldn't be cool. But uh, I'm all for certainly uh, moving forward and making the companies, whether it's uh, by the courts or by their own volition, to make things more accessible. Uh, again, I'm going to be switching to the Samsung, and I'm elated about that. Well, the stealth man, the fastest man on two artificial legs, 27-year-old Oscar Pistorius, Olympian and Paralympian, uh, who committed murder in, uh, I guess it was February 2014, 13, sorry. The murder trial, murder trial against him ended, uh, or actually was put on pause 30 days ago for a psychiat- psychiatric Evaluation. Now, this happens rarely, not too often. I consulted with an attorney about this. And sometimes when they feel that possibly this person isn't fit for trial and whether the defense is, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, prosecutor is asking for this or not, they will actually stop a trial and have this performed for the, uh, I guess, the safety and or the proper thing to do uh, by law for the defendant. Now, he claims, of course, you probably remember this, that he shot his girlfriend because he thought it was an intruder. And apparently he has long-standing issues as a child being disabled of not being able to defend himself. So the trial continued this past Monday. And I'm not up to speed totally, so I don't want to speak incorrectly about where it stands. But as of Monday, this is where it stood. But they did... um, have court orders, certainly for the messages, texts, etc., anything on social media, between Oscar and his girlfriend. And most of them were very loving, very cordial, uh, etc., ones that you would expect uh, lovers, boyfriend and girlfriend, to have exchanges of. But some were also dark. And there were a few that where she mentioned that she was scared. And I don't think that was targeted towards, I mean, targeted, sent to Oscar, but about Oscar that she sent to someone else. Now, when you think about this, there are possible uh, a few different solutions or endings, scenarios for this. Like uh, he could be found mentally incapacitated uh, and be sentenced to uh, institution. The court may find him that he has diminished capacity. So what that means, I believe this is Mark Farrell's interpretation that the trial can move forward, but this has to be taken. The proceedings push forward, but this has to be taken into consideration. So I guess the jury would have to consider this. And I don't know the parameters or ramifications of that would, how that would impact the, um, the outcome, the verdict. And also, if the experts all agree with the defense psychiatrist that he is unfit for trial, then that would be the outcome of that as well. So, you know, it's really a shame. Of course, you know, a loss of a life, certainly in this instance, is really tragic. And I just feel, personally, I feel that uh, maybe there could be a sense for Oscar that he is defenseless. But I just feel that he mentally was cognizant, aware. And this is something that um, maybe he's very, very sorry happened right now. But at the time, I think this is something that he wanted to accomplish and finish and something he wanted to do. 
Therefore, that's where we stand on the uh, 10th day of July, 2014. So moving on to uh, another page of violence. Oh, actually, I just got a uh, uh, text before, email, I should say. Someone inquired about where I am in speaking next. I will be speaking in New Jersey in uh, August, and I can give you all those details when I have them, and lots of schools in September and October on the uh, East Coast. If you want to find more about where I'll be speaking or hire me as a speaker to grades K through 12, college, corporate, and more nonprofit camps, go to markfarrellmotivation.com. Mark Farrell, F is in Frank, A R R E L L, motivation.com. Contact information is on that page. Of course, I speak about mental health, overcoming adversity, which, uh, you know, encapsulates a lot in this life. I use my visual impairment disability. Uh, as major examples of how I kind of suffered as a uh, child, how it made me stronger, more resilient, and the hurdles I had to get over a little higher, maybe a little bit more frequent than <laughs> other people's, but how it basically made me a better person, benefited me in the long run, personally and professionally. So that's that. Oh, also uh, drugs and alcohol and mental health. A lot of critical topics there. So this made international news the other day. And when I read about something like this, it really kind of gets under my skin because it's just really deplorable on every single level. In Salem County, New Jersey, southern New Jersey, uh, about oh, over two hours south of New York City, there was a fight between a woman and a woman with her two-year-old child present. So we'll call the one woman. Um, her actual name is Harris. Um, last name is Harris. She went up to a woman, uh, a mother, and I think there was over 20 punches thrown, physically beating this woman, throwing her to the ground, obscenities, kicking her, and spitting on her to top things off. Now, her two-year-old son, the mother who was receiving this pummeling, was actually trying to defend his mother, which is really sad to see. The video is online pretty disturbing, so be warned, trying to stop her, the assailant, as much as a two-year-old could by kicking the assailant in the ankles or in the shins, which obviously well, the child wasn't able to do. But here's the really upsetting part. In addition to the fact this this horrific crime was committed, there was about a dozen or so more bystanders right there doing absolutely nothing except being very, very concerned about capturing this on their phone. Because, you know, this is the society that we live in. Because if it's not up on YouTube or on some social media site, well, then I guess it just doesn't exist in this world. So would this woman have been prompted as much as she was if she... Maybe she didn't know she was being videotaped. I don't know. It's hard to tell from the angle. She does walk away something like, yeah, try to press charges now. So maybe she didn't realize she was being videotaped. But why wouldn't someone in their right mind... Regardless, I mean, obviously there are powers and numbers. If they didn't know what the fight was about, there was a child there. Why wouldn't have somebody even just said, you know, pull the child away so the child didn't see it? Maybe at first they didn't know who the child belonged to, whether it was the person causing the physical abuse or the recipient of the pummeling. It's really disturbing. So the woman actually, the mother who uh, was physically beat up, she uh, made her way to uh, a building down the street and she was treated. Um, minor injuries, thankfully. And uh, who knows what kind of injuries a two-year-old will have. Mentally. Psychiatrically. So that's something that um, the court is taking into consideration right now is that should the people, should there be a law, a bystander law, that where people such as the beating in Salem County, who witnessed this, did absolutely nothing, and if anything, encouraged it by filming it. This is kind of a very, very gray area. And if it were more black and white, I'd, I would say, yes, there should be a law. But with it being so gray and murky, that it has to be really be sussed out, really well-defined, and I'm sure worked out in about 10 different ways before it could possibly be um, sent down the chain for legislation. Because I just feel like um, if we start having bystander laws, you know, uh, where would the line be drawn? 
What if somebody is disabled who's standing there? What if someone is just completely in shock? How can you prove to maybe a jury and or a court or a judge that I was completely frozen, shell-shocked? I mean, that happens to a lot of people. It's the fight or flight syndrome. It can easily happen. So how would you prove things of that nature? I mean, it's an interesting, plausible scenario by passing law for bystanders. And, you know, I, I kind of would like to see that. But it's it's there are a lot of instances where I think it could really be really kind of dicey. And I would hate to see people be, you know, wrongly uh, prosecuted, ticketed, etc. But this is really, really sad to see someone suffer a beating like this. I had mentioned in previous shows that uh, when I lived in Hoboken, New Jersey, right across the water here, great town, by the way, great town. I call it the um, <laughs> sixth borough of New York because it's like Mayberry. It's really cool. Great little shops, restaurants. Most of all, you know, the people really make it really nice. They really make it a colorful town, uh, very enjoyable, easy to navigate. The path train's there. You can work in New York City and get in within minutes. I mean, within under 10 minutes if you're taking the path train or the ferry. A lot of options. But unfortunately, there's an element of crime in there. Of course, no surprise, because it's next to a major city. It's a metropolitan town. So um, about from what witnesses said, 15 to 19 kids attacked me. And I don't know how many witnesses there were, but no one picked up the phone and called 911. No one screamed like, hey, fire, whatever you need to do to stop a crime like that. And I didn't get stuck on that. I realized people are people, human nature. They get scared. They don't know what to do. They walk the other way, such as, well, actually, unlike the Salem County beating where they actually just stood there and took became all amateur photographers and videographers. So... It, you know, it happens. But how do we deter this? You know, that's a huge, major question. The overall macro issue is like, how do we deter violent crimes? But more importantly, as the uh, story line kind of developed, how do we deter people who are just standing on the sidelines from standing there? Take action or even just walk away. Worst case scenario, walk away. Or best case scenario, Best case scenario, where the crime doesn't happen at all. So it's a really unfortunate thing. I mean, these take place. As a matter of fact, this morning, a major crime took place where uh, we're getting more into the uh, weapons area now. But uh, uh, father shot, I believe, three or four of his kids in Texas, I believe. And then was on his way to take out either his parents or his wife's parents. And I believe was apprehended before he did so. So, I mean, we live in a violent nation. Uh, some say not nearly as violent as other nations. But, <laughs> nonetheless, it's still pretty violent. On to happier messages. Sunday's plans, what do they include? World Cup? Who are you rooting for? Argentina. Germany. I think my money's on Germany. I think I may root for Argentina, but I think my money's on Germany. Not that I'm a gambling man. What about you, Luke? Are you a gambling man? He shakes his head no. He's thinking about pizza. He's thinking about lunch. That's my son. He's off from school today. Hanging out in New York City. Dying to go on a double-decker bus. Have you ever been on a double-decker bus? If you haven't visited New York, it's one of the things that you must do. <laughs> Special thanks to uh, our guest today, Tom Nazario, for writing a great book, uh, Living on a Dollar a Day. Can you do that? No way. I mean, how could you possibly do that? But it really kind of opens your eyes about how we live, the money that we spend unnecessarily, live lavish, most of us live more than lavish lifestyles. We live in debt because we can. We are sort of a society of entitlement, entitled society, where we feel that even if we don't have it, we deserve to have it. If we can't afford it, hell, that's what credit's for, right? <laughs> and we'll go back to 2008 when we uh, all dry up and the banks are in trouble and they need bailouts again. Again, if you'd like to have me speak to your school organization, camp, etc., Mark Farrell, motivation.com. That's M A R K F is in Frank, A R R E L L, motivation.com. Special thanks always to Giselle and the Controls, Jason Tobinfeld, Casey doing a fine job, Gary Knowles next. Look forward to speaking to you next Thursday, as I do every Thursday from 11 to noon. Special, special birthday wishes to Pretty Singh. 
who's turning a very, very young age tomorrow. Absolutely gorgeous and pivotal to the life of Mark Farrell and many others who know her, love her as a friend, and more. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. And we'll talk to you soon. This is PRN.FM. My name is Mark Farrell.